Wisconsin State Capital Programming is made possible with support from Quick Trip, Wisconsin Realtors Association, and Wisconsin Counties Association. Wisconsin Eye is an independent, nonprofit public affairs broadcast network. Watch Wisconsin Eye on Spectrum Channels 995 and 363 and at wiseye.org. Thank you. With that, uh, we're going to call the here, the meeting together for campaigns and elections. We'll take the roll first. Representative Branchin here. Representative Sanfilippo. Representative Tussler. Here. Representative Feesfeld is excused. Representative Murphy here. Representative Roser. Representative Streitzer here. Representative Subek and Representative Emerson. I'm assuming uh, it's it's that kind of a day. We have a lot of meetings coming and going. You will see people coming and going today, and it's not meant to be um, disrespectful. It's we have a busy day in the Capitol going on today. With that, Representative, would you mind doing the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, thank you. So today um, we have, this is an informational meeting, and we have um, Miss Megan Wolf and Mr. Kehoe. I don't have your first name. Robert. Robert Kehoe. Should we address you as, how would you like to be addressed? Robert is fine. Robert is fine. Ms. Wolf, Megan, or, okay. Um, and this is a conversation about the WEC voter 
database. So I think you have a presentation for us. We do. So thank you so much and good morning, uh, Chairwoman Branchin and committee members. I'm Megan Wolf, the administrator of the Wisconsin Elections Commission, and thank you for inviting us to present today. We hope today to provide a useful overview of the state's voter registration system and data practices. We look forward to answering questions committee members may have following our presentation. It's been more than one year since the 2020 presidential election, and the Elections Commission, lawmakers, and others continue to receive and respond to questions and concerns about how our elections are run. It's become one of our primary responsibilities to answer these questions, investigate when there are concerns, and inform the public and lawmakers about our state's complex election systems. We're grateful to this committee for giving us the opportunity to answer some of the questions people have about Wisconsin elections and to also clarify some of the more complicated and easily misunderstood aspects of election administration. Today, we'll focus on WISVOTE, our homegrown voter database, so that people can understand how WISVOTE helps Wisconsin conduct accurate, secure elections that generate data for public availability and accountability. A lot of the concerns about the November 2020 presidential election are based on assumptions that lack full understanding of election policies, laws, and technologies. Other concerns expressed to this committee have alleged startling claims of fraud without providing evidence. With these concerns are brought to our attention, we investigate them. This includes many of the questions, concerns, and claims that have been brought before this committee. Nearly all of these concerns can easily be explained and understood once placed in context of how our election systems work. We're prepared today to answer your questions about specific claims and look forward to that conversation. Many of the questions raised have simple answers, but also require background information before we can have a meaningful discussion. So we look forward to providing that today. I'll now hand it off to our technology director, Robert Kehoe, who will present on our WISVOTE system, and then following his remarks, we'd be glad to both answer any questions that you might have. Good morning, and thank you for the opportunity to present before this committee. Uh, I've not previously spoken here, so I should introduce myself. My name is Robert Kehoe, and I am the Technology Director for the Wisconsin Elections Commission. That job title means that I am responsible for the small team of people that provide technical development, maintenance, training, and support to WISVOTE and to WISVOTE users. Uh, fair warning, I don't have a background in state or local government. Uh, instead, I've spent most of my adult life working for the United States Army in one capacity or another. I started off in signal intelligence in uh, Cold War era units that were called uh, Combat Electronic Warfare Intelligence Battalions. And uh, the only elections experience I gained as a soldier was helping to plan and execute the first democratic elections in Iraq while I was serving as task force operations officer for a combined arms task force responsible for approximately 900 square miles of territory sandwiched between Baghdad, Samarra, and Fallujah. So as you might imagine, election security meant something else over there. I joined the Wisconsin Elections Commission just prior to the 2018 general election. So I was not involved in development of the statewide system, nor was I involved in any of the design decisions that led to its current structure. I point this out to say that I'm not vested in the system's foundation, and I'm happy to discuss both its strengths and its weaknesses. We are always looking for ways to improve the system, and there are certainly opportunities for improvement. I'm not offended by legitimate, informed criticism of the system. So my intent today is to speak a bit about the system called WISVOTE and to address some of the questions and concerns that people have raised about the system. I believe it is important to address questions and concerns in part to distinguish between genuine issues worthy of our energy to address and falsehoods that cause us to waste countless hours chasing ghosts. If we fail to make this distinction, then Wisconsin will have lost an opportunity to address real concerns while focusing on imaginary anxieties. 
I'll start with a brief discussion of what WISVOTE is, and perhaps more importantly, what it is not. WISVOTE is Wisconsin's comprehensive voter database and election management system. So what does that mean? Well, when I say the word comprehensive, I'm referencing the fact that WISVOTE contains almost the entirety of Wisconsin's electronic voter registration and election administration history. This is arguably its most powerful and useful function, because when anyone asks what happened, it is this feature that provides the answer. WISVOTE also contains many functions and capabilities besides simply maintaining voter registration data. But beyond voter history, there are three major components, elections, addressing, and training. WISVOTE's election management module is a complete planning tool for over 1,800 municipal clerks, a system that allows them to plan elections, track deadlines, designate polling places, schedule poll workers, manage ballot styles, track absentee ballots, and organize contests and candidates. And probably something else I'm forgetting. Next, we have the addressing module, which is one of Wisconsin's most comprehensive geospatial information systems, allowing Wisconsin's county and local officials to precisely track innumerable boundaries from assembly districts to sanitary districts, and how millions of address data points fit within them. Finally, we have a training module that provides local officials a complete repository to track and train election officials. I'd point out that I refer to WISVOTE as a system because that's what it is. WISVOTE is not a single piece of software or a single database. It most certainly doesn't reside on a single computer. And speaking of what it is not, WISVOTE is not Wisconsin's voter rolls. It is not merely a list of voters, and it is not a poll book, although it can generate poll books. This is an important distinction because we so often hear references to the voter rolls a term that actually isn't in Wisconsin statutes. What other states and nations call voter rolls, Wisconsin calls a poll book. Generating poll books is but a tiny fraction of WISVOTE's functionality. The distinction between a comprehensive election administration system and voter rolls is enormously significant. When people ask for all the voter data in WISVOTE, they're asking for all of Wisconsin's election history going back well before the WEC, before the GAB, even before the existence of any state-maintained voter registration system. So when someone claims in a public hearing before this committee that there are 1.5 million illegal registrations and tens of thousands of, quote, confirmed fake voters, I sit up and take note. These are stunning claims, and they have my attention. And then we see an active voter record on the screen that says Ambrose Adventure. And my first thought is, that is awfully unusual. Is that one of the illegal registrations? Is that a confirmed fake voter? Why else would this record be on the screen? So I visited Wisconsin's public circuit court records and typed in the name. And after about 30 seconds, I found the court records of this gentleman legally changing his name. It turns out this is the legal name of a lawfully registered voter. A quick check in WISVOTE confirmed that this voter registration information was matched against DOT records, affirming that the voter has a valid Wisconsin driver's license in the name of Ambrose Adventure. In the end, it took me a few minutes on a public website to solve the case of Mr. Adventure, that's what due diligence looks like. No supercomputer is required. Of course, that is just one record. There are allegedly 1,499,999 more records to consider. And given the opportunity, we will review each and every one. We examine every question or claim we receive, including each of the claims made at last week's hearing. And we can, after appropriate research, discuss any question or claim presented to the agency. 
I'll discuss a few in my comments. And of course, we're happy to answer questions at the conclusion of this presentation. WISVOTE contains an enormous quantity of data, but raw data without context isn't very meaningful. So how was WISVOTE developed? Anyone who voted in Wisconsin before 2005 was registered to vote before a statewide system existed. I would hazard a guess that this applies to most of the people in the room today. This means that we voted before registration was even required statewide. Only municipalities with a population over 5,000 people had to maintain a registration list at all. What data to retain and how to retain it was left up to individual jurisdictions. Over 60 different types of software, including simple word processors, were used to keep registration data. When the State Elections Board created Wisconsin's first statewide system, all legacy data from local jurisdictions was imported as is. That is, the State Elections Board did not add, subtract, or modify any of the imported data. Voters who were lawfully registered to vote before the creation of the statewide system remained registered to vote after creation of the statewide system. This imported data included whatever registration numbering scheme each municipality used at the time. This includes some pretty odd schemes using letters and special characters. So when you find a funny looking registration number, there's a high likelihood that the voter has been registered for over 20 or more years. Even today, if these voters move and re-register in Wisconsin, local clerks may elect to merge the new record into the old, allowing the old registration number to remain active. This, of course, has no effect on the voter's eligibility to cast a ballot because registration numbers are not a requirement to vote in the United States. The system we call WISVOTE only dates to 2016. The state was not satisfied with the performance or capabilities of prior systems and decided to create a new system that would be more user-friendly and easier to develop and maintain over time. The WISVOTE user interface, interface that you saw earlier was constructed on Microsoft Dynamics software with custom displays and functions developed entirely in-house. When the state of Wisconsin chose to create WISVOTE, this does not mean it began with an empty database, of course. Voters in earlier iterations of the statewide system were imported into WISVOTE. There simply was, at the time, no legal basis for the agency to remove or otherwise alter existing voter records. So as a result, all data from the prior system was carried over to the new system. That practice of preserving data was established by the State Elections Board in 2005 was maintained by the Government Accountability Board during its tenure and continues to be upheld by the Wisconsin Elections Commission. New data may be added, but old information is never destroyed. This, of course, means, for better or for worse, that we keep our mistakes for the world to see, in some cases quite a lot of them. It also means that the number of old inactive records in WISVOTE will continue to grow. Last week, we heard the unusual claim that the statewide database only rarely shrinks. That's wrong. The database in Wisconsin, of Wisconsin's election history never shrinks. It only grows and will continue to grow, just as the tax records in the Department of Revenue will continue to grow, and the driver's license records in the Department of Transportation will continue to grow. The Wisconsin Elections Commission keeps inactive records in WISVOTE because Wisconsin law requires it. Under the statutes, there are two statuses, eligible and ineligible, that apply to individuals on the registration list. The change from eligible to ineligible status is repeatedly and explicitly referenced in the statutes. No statute mentions any process for deleting an individual from the list, and therefore, the WEC does not delete records. Within WISVOTE, the WEC uses the term active to refer to eligible voters, 
and inactive to refer to ineligible voters. An individual being registered and entered into the system generates registration data, and every action taken involving that account will generate more data in WISFO. The second but no less important reason to retain ineligible voter records is to safeguard against fraud. The retention of voter history does not make it any easier to commit elections fraud. It is no more difficult or easy to change a voter record than it is to create one from scratch. In fact, if anything, it may be harder to alter an existing record. Voters who wish to uh, become registered in a new location, must re-register and a new record is created for them. Voters cannot simply reactivate their record and no mechanism exists for voters to do so. Now, of course, we've heard people ask, why not separate the active... Can I I ask one question? I just want to understand, and and I apologize for interrupting you. Um, You said that some clerks choose, I thought in the previous part of this, said some clerks choose not to give new voter numbers. And now you're saying that you must. Am I misunderstanding something in here? Yes. So when a voter moves, they have to create a new registration record. So, for example, I moved from the Stevens Point area to the Madison area. And when I did that, my for a brief time, when I registered in Madison, I there were two voter records with my name. The old record in the Stevens Point area and the new record in Dane County. So the municipal clerk in Dane County would receive an alert that Robert Kehoe has two voter records. And of course, that isn't right. So the municipal clerk would look at that, determine which is the new record, and merge the old record into the new record. So combining the two records into one. So would you have one voter number or two? There would be two for a brief period of time until the clerk merged the two records. And then your new registration record is going to have your your new current voter registration number, but your old record with the old number will be part of your history. And so if somebody bought a list or was looking at inactive records, they're going to see your old record with your old number as well. But how the clerk sees it is that's just part of that voter's history under their new number. Okay, so I, I just want to make sure, though, I, I thought I read from your testimony that you said some clerks choose not to, here we have it, when you find a funny-looking register, it's a high like the voter has been registered for 20 more, and even today these voters move, they may, clerks may elect to merge the new record into the old. So some clerks may leave two records? No, nope, the merger eliminates one of the records. So that act of merging means that only one record is left behind. But you say clerks may... May merge the old record into the new, or so they may merge do. the new into the old. You so. can go in two directions. Okay. But it becomes one. But it becomes one. Yeah. Okay. I, I, I think Tesla has... Uh, excuse me, Representative Tesla has a quick question here, too, on this. I was going to... Okay. okay. Sorry. Thank no you. Problem. I just wanted to make sure I was understanding this. Thank sure. you. So I was just making the observation that we have had, of course, people ask us, uh, why not separate the active and inactive records? And that is a a logical question, uh, particularly for the layperson. The answer is that active and inactive records are separated. Uh, They're separated by their designations in the system. This isn't about physical separation. We can't or don't have active records on one disk and inactive records on another. The system called WISVOTE is already distributed between more than 50 different servers and located in different Wisconsin cities. So why then, when someone purchases a copy of the voter registration database, do they receive both active and inactive records? Well, the answer is because that's what the customer asked for. When a customer asks for all inactive and active records in the entire database, That is what they will receive. So even if we put the inactive records on a separate drive in a faraway place, customers asking for the entire database would still receive both active and inactive records. Now, clerks can uh, reactivate an inactive record. 
but they must document their reasons for doing so. And furthermore, clerks and agency staff can only reactivate one record at a time. That's a control that was implemented years ago to prevent accidental reactivations. In the presentation last week, we repeatedly saw inactive records presented to apparently support the claim that illegal registrations exist or that tens of thousands of fake voters exist. But not one inactive record is registered to vote. They are, by definition, ineligible to vote, and they do not appear on poll books. Put another way, inactive voter records are not on Wisconsin's voter roll. So who are these clerks and staff that have access to WISVOTE? Well, municipal clerks are the owners of their voter data, and with few exceptions, they manage their own jurisdiction's voter records. They're not state employees, and they do not report to the Wisconsin Elections Commission. To gain access and learn the way around WISVOTE, there are a series of steps they must navigate, starting with a request and authorization form. And even before any access to the system is granted, we ask them to complete several agreements, complete security awareness training, and have remote monitoring on their systems. Only after completing these steps are they provided credentials and allowed access. Of course, many more hours of training are required to develop familiarity with the system and how it functions. Clerks, of course, are not the only elections partners. Uh, The information contained in WISVOTE is regularly assessed in a variety of deliberate processes occurring before, during, and after each election. The Department of Corrections, Department of Health Services, and Department of Transportation all regularly provide uh, the WEC updates. For example, new or updated voter registrations other than military and overseas voters, are checked daily against Department of Transportation records. Data mismatches are flagged and reported to local clerks for follow-up. The system accurately flags all mismatches, whether they result from a typo or from a willful attempt to mislead. The ERIC Consortium of 31 states also provides a considerable volume of information to help maintain accurate voter records. Through ERIC, we receive information from 30 other states about voters who moved, voters who died, and voters who may have voted twice. Yes, ERIC also requires Wisconsin to contact eligible but unregistered voters with a postcard every every other year. Uh, Meanwhile, they're providing us information on deaths and duplicate registrations every month. These checks can and do catch individuals violating election laws. Working with local officials and law enforcement, the WEC has identified and referred cases of double voting, cases of felons voting, and cases of inaccurate voter registrations. Of course, the statewide system is not infallible. For example, Online voter registration checks with DOT are efficient at identifying bad data, but they cannot distinguish a residential address from a non-residential address. This is an instance where I think many people have identified a real concern worthy of our attention. We know that people sometimes register with a non-residential address, such as a UPS store. Whether that conduct is innocent or intentional, doing so violates the requirement that voters list the address where they actually reside. Wisconsin's system, however, only checks that the driver's license information supplied on the voter registration form matches the DOT records. If the data matches, then no further action occurs and the registration is accepted. This is a particularly challenging problem because there are certainly examples throughout Wisconsin where people may actually live in a shared space with a business, for example, in an apartment above the storefront. Moreover, small businesses change frequently, so simply maintaining an accurate database of non-residential addresses would be very difficult, if not impossible. 
We are currently studying the feasibility of a feature that would allow clerks to flag local addresses that they know are not residential. Ordinary citizens can and do report these non-residential registrations and other concerns to the Elections Commission on a regular basis. They can do this because Wisconsin voter data is readily available and in the hands of thousands of regular people across Wisconsin. Uh, I mentioned this to refute comments made last week that you need a supercomputer to read voter data or that the voters of Wisconsin have never seen this data. Both statements are incorrect. The Wisconsin Elections Commission does not have a supercomputer. Any computer made in the last 20 years can read the database just fine. The limiting factor is the size of the data set and the software used to read it. If you want to download and analyze the entire electronic voting history of the state of Wisconsin, then you need some specialized database software, not to mention a lot of money. But if you're looking at any jurisdiction smaller than a million residents, you can do it with Microsoft Office. Likewise, looking at specific data sets costs a lot less than the entire history of the state. For example, looking locally, if you want to download all the voters in Cottage Grove, it'll cost you 50 bucks. A larger jurisdiction like the city of Waukesha costs about $200. Now while this is hardly cheap, uh, candidates, campaigns, and citizens are still making over 1,000 purchases per year. This includes an average of 20 copies of the complete $12,500 database that have been purchased every single year for the last 10 years. So lots of people have seen the whole database going back uh, a decade. And finding out who, if you're curious, is the, just a simple public records request. You'll find customers on both sides of the political aisle. Uh, I will, however, be the first to admit that $12,500 is a lot of money. Um, as was noted last week, this requirement to charge a fee is in statute, and the rates applied are in the administrative code. Wisconsin's data is not cheap, but Wisconsin is also one of the few states to make the data readily available for near instant downloads 24-7, 365 on a public website. And finally, it's worth noting that of all the revenue generated between 2012 and 2021, very little of it went to the Wisconsin Elections Commission or to its predecessor agencies. Likewise, none of the funds were paid, reserved, or otherwise set aside for Eric or anybody else. So this brings us full circle back to the topic of claims about the system, the agency, or elections generally. The Wisconsin Elections Commission takes claims of fraud seriously, and nearly every member of our modest staff has at some point researched allegations of wrongdoing. We investigate each specific allegation of wrongdoing within our statutory jurisdiction. And these allegations tend to fall in two categories. Here's one category of claims that comes from people who make spectacular, shocking allegations, but always offer to provide the evidence later. They ask rhetorical questions on social media or in hearings like this one, but they don't ba bother to ask the Wisconsin Elections Commission or any Wisconsin election officials. Sometimes they provide snippets of data that fail even the most basic scrutiny. We can only examine and respond to information that we are provided. For example, there was this slide last week that Summers, Wisconsin has 359 registered voters under an old street name of 4XX Outer Loop Road. I'm not sure what was being claimed with this information. Perhaps this was a claim that 359 people are illegal registrations. Or perhaps it was a claim that 359 people are fake. Perhaps this was simply a claim that it's impossible for 359 people to have resided at this address. I don't know because it wasn't said. In the case of this example, however, just enough information was provided that we could figure out the address because it turns out 
Outer Loop Road in Summers, Wisconsin, is just 1.4 miles long, and as the name suggests, it's a loop. It's a loop that's now called University Drive. It wraps around the UW Parkside campus and is home to their residence halls. 4019 University Drive is the school's massive apartment complex, housing single, double, and quadruple bedroom units. So in fact, it is not at all surprising that 359 people are registered with this address. Another example uh, actually provided us an address. Now again, there was the vague implication that something was amiss because hundreds and hundreds of people uh, were and are registered at 437 North Francis Street in the city of Madison. But here it is, 437 North Francis Street is one of the largest apartment complexes in the city. In fact, there are currently over 800 people registered to vote from this complex. And in case you're wondering, every single one of them has an apartment number recorded in their voter registration as well. So what about voter records? We can look at those too. Here's another vague claim that seems to imply these registrations are illegal or perhaps fake. I'm frankly not sure why else they would have been presented in public. These voters all share an address. They share a phone number and they share their last names. They all registered around the same time within minutes of each other. Is that strange? Some people think so. I do not, because these people all have different birth dates and different driver's license numbers. And the average age difference between each pair is about 25 years. So I have a hunch that just maybe these voters share a name and reside at the same house because they're related. But some people are using these voters to support their claim that tens of thousands of fake records were created to cast ballots in the 2020 general election. Again, there's a shocking and frightening claim, still without one single example. But even without specific examples, we can examine the claim itself. I can ask, what would it take to perpetrate such a, such a spectacular and massive fraud? What are the obstacles I'd face? Well, there are a few. First, WISVOTE, records every transaction in the system. So you can create new voters or reactivate ineligible voters, but there will be a record of who performed the transaction and when. Second, each online registration will automatically generate a notification to the jurisdiction where the voter was registered. The local clerk's office will receive an electronic alert that the new record was created. Third, each new registration, online or not, is automatically transmitted to the Department of Transportation and checked against their records. Only mismatches generated an alert to clerks, but the data transmission and the DOT checks themselves will create records. Fourth, we need to get each record a ballot. So if you want to go the absentee ballot route, we have to create an absentee ballot request. That's another record in the system. Fifth, each absentee ballot request has to have a photo ID associated with it. So you either have to use voter records that already have a photo ID on file, or you have to provide a photo ID. If you choose that second option, the system retains an image of the ID, which must be reviewed and validated by the local clerk's office. Uh, sixth, your absentee ballot request just generated another alert to the local clerk's office, because they're the ones that have to print stuff and mail the ballot. The state of Wisconsin does not uh, issue ballots. Moving on. Seventh, your new absentee ballot is associated with a postal service tracking code. So if you need to mail a ballot, there will be a record of its movement through the postal system. Eighth, unique barcodes associated with the elector and the ballot are generated, recorded, and affixed to the ballot envelope. 
the location and manner of ballot delivery is recorded. Ninth, the sealed ballot's return is electronically recorded, creating yet another record. Tenth, the sealed ballot must be inspected for sufficiency and opened on election day in a designated polling place in view of any observers. And the name of each voter must be read aloud. Right now, I'm sure someone is thinking, well, couldn't they do this illegally behind closed doors somewhere? And I suppose they could, but they'd still have to figure out how to make their vote totals match with the reports submitted by the poll workers at each polling place. Eleventh, the final disposition of the ballot is retained and recorded against the voter record. Um, If we decided to go with an in-person ballot, then you'll need a voter registration record and someone to sign the poll book. Uh, Twelfth, you'd have to erase or otherwise block the participation record from appearing in my vote because otherwise people could look up their own records. Thirteenth, the paper ballot record is retained by each jurisdiction. Fourteenth, the ballot envelope is retained by each jurisdiction. Of course, local records then uh, are submitted to a municipal canvas review by municipal officials at each and every municipality in the state of Wisconsin, followed by a board of canvas review at the county level, and finally a state certification process. Uh, Not quite done. Uh, We still have uh, a number of jurisdictions that are selected for post-election audits at random. That selection project. Uh, process and the random selection of those jurisdictions is broadcast live. Finally, each and every jurisdiction in the state of Wisconsin has to uh, perform a reconciliation process to ensure the ballots, the actual number of ballots submitted uh, matches the number of ballots reported by poll workers. And finally, in the last year, the Legislative Audit Bureau performed a rather exhaustive audit of the agency. If we wanted to leave this out of the WIS vote system. Yes, we, yes actually, we, we provided them. Uh, as a matter of fact, I, I wrote a, a, quite a lot about the WIS vote system and provided information to the LAB myself. I, I guess I don't remember a review of the WIS vote system on uh, other than pages 33 through 34 in regards to the Eric system. I'm sorry, please yeah. go ahead. Uh, so if you do want to delete this uh, entire record trail, I personally don't think it's possible, but at, the, at a minimum, you would need the cooperation of nearly every staff member in the Wisconsin Elections Commission, and you would need the cooperation of virtually every Wisconsin county clerk, and you would also need the cooperation of every municipality, municipal clerk uh, and their staff for any municipality where this scenario occurs. The statewide system and its audit trail, of course, is hosted by the Division of Enterprise Technology, not by the Wisconsin Elections Commission. So you would need the cooperation of staff at the Division of Enterprise Technology all the way to the top. You almost certainly would need some local IT staff, too, because all of this data is going to leave a trail. And you probably would need to also secure the assistance of the United States Postal Service if you want to take care of the postal tracking data. Finally, you'd have to hope that not one of Wisconsin's 3,400 WISFO users or tens of thousands of volunteer poll workers, or the janitor for that matter, notices any of this. But don't take my word for it. Each of these processes is well documented and thousands of election officials and volunteers have performed them year after year, long before I showed up just a few years ago. Now, I promised I wouldn't go through each and every claim in this presentation, so I will not do that. Um, But we are happy to discuss any claims the committee wishes to bring up in questions. Um, I also said that there were two categories of claims that we received, so I should explain the second category. It consists of groups and individuals who come to us with questions and concerns about specific voters, records, or transactions. This category of claims comes from people who have expended the effort to collect 
analyze, and present their evidence for consideration. More importantly, they're willing to share their findings publicly and ask questions. For example, we recently worked with a group of conservative voters and the Fond du Lac County Sheriff's Department to investigate claims that convicted felons had participated in the 2020 general election. This civic group, working independently with public data, had identified numerous people that they thought might have been uh, voted as felons who were still serving their sentences and thus ineligible to vote. Agency staff working with the Department of Corrections were able to review each of this group's claims and ultimately confirm several of them were accurate. It turned out that each of these individuals had already been identified and referred for prosecution, but that doesn't diminish the efforts of this civic group and those like them, groups that share their findings and perform their due diligence before making accusations. Another example comes from private citizens who accurately identified concerns with the accuracy of election day registration data. The November 2020 general election saw over 200,000 people register on election day in Wisconsin. The overwhelming majority of these registrations were completed on handwritten applications that must then be manually typed into the database in the offices of local clerks. As you might imagine, this is an incredibly slow and tedious task. Large jurisdictions have more staff, but they also have more registrations, while small towns may have fewer regist registrants, but just one part-time clerk to type them all in. This adds up to thousands of typos in the data. We see errors in names, addresses, dates of birth, and driver's license numbers. These errors, in turn, create more work for clerks because each instance must be identified and corrected. The impact of this issue is significant, but private citizens examining data purchased from the Elections Commission have helped to identify problems and chip away at this massive task. I bring up these examples to illustrate that there is value in private citizens examining election data and that there are very real problems like non-residential addresses that need to be addressed. But the serious researchers examine specific data, document their work, and don't make spectacular unsupported claims. The Wisconsin Elections Commission takes all allegations of misconduct seriously and investigates each claim where supporting evidence is provided. Wisconsin election officials at all levels identify some misconduct every year. And every year, these cases are referred for criminal prosecution. But we perform our due diligence before accusing individuals of misconduct. We collaborate with other agencies and investigators at all levels, and we carefully document our evidence. Unfortunately, there are people who instead choose to draw their own conclusions and choose not to ask a single elections official, be they state employees, county employees, or your local clerk's office. Making unverified fantastical claims without consulting real election officials has the effect of diverting lawmakers and the public from tracking real issues in need of improvement. That could end up causing real harm to Wisconsin elections. WISVOTE is an end-to-end -end elections management system. It is not static, it is not simple, and it most certainly is not flawless. When people want to understand the system or the data within it, they usually ask. The Wisconsin Elections Commission answers dozens of questions every day, and we are happy to do so. We hope that our important role educating and explaining our election systems can help promote productive conversations about improving elections for the future in Wisconsin. Thank you for your time today. Thank you for your presentation and thank you very much for your service. We certainly appreciate you. your military service as well. Questions? Representative Tesler. Thank you, and I wanted to also thank you for your military service, thank especially you. your uh, um, you were specific on kind of what you worked on, and I found that interesting and uh, 
appreciate somebody that's that spent part of their career anyway uh, fighting communism. Uh, I think that uh, uh, was a great uh, great thing for you to do. So I appreciate that. Thank you. Now, one of the things that you said, um, well, I, I have a few things I wanted to go over. But one of the things you mentioned is that you promised yourself, I think it was, that you wouldn't go into every allegation. That's what I want to hear, though. So we hear all these allegations, too. Mm-hmm. We're on campaigns and elections. When we hear these allegations, a lot of times we understand a presentation like this that you provided, but we, we don't have is, is that specific knowledge that you guys have, and that's what we need to hear because each one of these allegations, you know, for the most part, would be pretty terrible if they were true. Absolutely. And what I think that WEC should do in the future and work on doing a, perhaps a better job of, for lack of a better term to say, is to identify these allegations and try to get after them. Because to me, it's kind of a passive approach when you're saying, well, you got to come to me with a specific question and with some significant evidence of it. And then once we've received that information, then if we deem it credible enough, we'll spend our time. What I want to do is I want to see you guys go after these groups and basically say, look, this is your allegation. We looked into it. We spent our time because that's what these folks want. Those folks that have these concerns, they don't strike me as poorly intended, but I think a lot of times they they need information that they don't have, and we rely on WEC to, to provide that. That's that's. I mean, I, I believe uh, Ms. Wolf said that the primary function of WEC right now is to respond to some of these election uh, theories, and if that's the primary function, I'd really like to see more action on this stuff. And the stuff you brought up. You know, I assume that's probably the easiest stuff to explain, but they are ridiculous. Like, I mean, it, it is. It helps me a lot to hear this outer loop story regarding that issue because I can hear that and say, okay, well, there's a reason why somebody would think that, and there's a reason why it's not true. So, to me, I would have loved to hear more about that, other than just kind of the I think probably the easiest to explain situations about these allegations when it comes to the the. How wistful it works, though. I mean, I, I appreciate knowing more about it, um, but it's really trying to get to these allegations is a big concern because there are literally tens of thousands of people in Wisconsin that are very, very interested in this, and that's why you're getting so much interest. Now, another thing that I think you, that I just like you guys to consider is is the terminology that you use. So, the terminology you guys mentioned was or that you stated in your presentation as we're you know, these, these theories are chasing ghosts, they're imaginary anxieties, they're spectacular and unsupported claims, they're sensational claims, and they're fantastical claims, as I think all terms that were used in your presentation. When you use those terms, you present a bias to the folks that are hearing these. Now, if you want to say the outer loop example is a fantastical claim and a sensationalized claim because... Obviously, this was fairly easy for you to look into, or the individual Ambrose advantage or whatever. That specific claim is an adva- is a fantastical claim, and you can make that, and, and I appreciate that terminology. But when you're saying all claims, no matter what you have to say, before we've even heard of them, are spectacular, fantastical, or ima- imaginary anxieties, that's not the function of WEC. It's the function of the party that likes you know, the results of an election, because they're partisan individuals. The idea is, is for them to, to make particular arguments so that, both, so that we can kind of have an adversarial system where we, make, we hear different words from different people. But WEC isn't supposed to be a partisan group. It's not supposed to have these biases. So the terminologies that you use is super important. I just, you know, I'd like you to just kind of consider the terminology you use next time because... People are watching, and I think that when they hear that stuff, they think that you're not listening, mm-hmm. and you don't want to hear more claims. And the truth is, is you want to hear good claims, real claims, claims that might be out there that are legitimate, and you don't really want the fantastical claims necessarily, but unfortunately sometimes you have to, you know, kind of dig through some hay before you, uh, you know, find that needle, and and that's kind of an issue. So, you know, those are just two things that, I just wanted to provide as comments, 
you know, from maybe a different perspective. Do you have um, a question? I just want to make sure we, I'm sure we have a lot of questions today, so. Yeah, sure. So, um, okay, so if the primary function of the WEC right now is to respond to some of this, have you thought about or would you consider maybe leaving Madison and talking to some of these groups? Um, you know, I, I bet there would be people in northeast Wisconsin that would love to have a town hall where some folks that are big advocates of some of these theories could speak with you guys and maybe some things could get sorted out. And also, have you thought about providing some of these answers, you know, especially to some of these easy theories, these theories that are out there and getting reposted and all that kind of stuff thousands of times on your website, you know, and going proactive and, and getting this information out there ahead of time? Because this has been a difficult dialogue, I think, mm -hmm. in that... We asked some questions in December of 2020, and then maybe an answer comes back in April of 2020, and then we have another hearing in July of 2021 or whatever. And it's a very slow process is kind of this, this hearing process that we've had. We hear these theories, and then a month later we hear the answers if we're lucky. But if you guys could get proactive on, on some of the information, I really think that there's things that can be done that would at least resolve – because there's – 50 plus conspiracy theories out there and if we could narrow down the most tangible ones and kind of get rid of some of these easy, these maybe easier to re explain ones I think would all be in a better place right now so have you considered doing those things or would you at least consider that as an idea of how to communicate better with maybe folks of you know uh, different persuasions well, thank you, first of all, very much, Representative Tussler. I think those are all good points and very well taken, um, especially the one about the language we use. I, I think you're right that, you know, that is something we could stand to be more careful about and deliberate about because we want people to bring their concerns to us. We, we really do. And I think that we have a strong reputation. If you talk to people who call our office, you get a person, you get to talk to a person, and we take people seriously. We respect the people that call our office, and so we want to make sure we're, we're conveying that. Um, in terms of doing more to answer questions, I think that's a really good point as well, and one where we struggle in terms of just you know resources to answer every single unsubstantiated question or concern that comes to our office. Uh, there's a formal complaint process. Those go before the commission. Those require a sworn statement. But then there's these things that come to us either through informational hearings like that are held here or other places where we do research them. And we actually do put out um, our frequently answer, asked questions on those topics. This whole back half of my binder here is our frequently asked questions that are on our website. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of these claims that have come in, so let's say it was the default voter registration date that people were concerned about or inactive versus active records. There are a whole bunch of these questions that we put out, and we don't directly say, so-and-so asked us this question, and here's our rebuttal. We try to make it more general so that people can share that information and use it. Now, that being said, we do that. We put a lot of work into it, and I think that it's a good effort. I don't know how widely it's, it, it is used. And if, if folks like you don't know about it, then that means we're not doing enough to make sure you know about where to find these resources. Um, so I took a lot from that conversation. I thank you for bringing those things up. And I think we'd certainly be willing to talk to groups that have these concerns. Um, sometimes that can get a little unwieldy when everybody, you know, I'm sure as you all know, um, when everybody wants to talk to us about every concern they have um, without doing any sort of homework. But I think if there were some way to organize that so we could have conversations, hear different viewpoints, I think we'd be very open to that. I mean, you know, most of us, we're not from Madison, right? I'm from, I'm from more northern Wisconsin. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm always glad to make a trip uh, up north if, if that's what um, the job requires. Reverend Spicer. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Megan and Robert, for being here and for the thorough presentation. I have a couple of questions, and I guess starting on a follow-up to Representative Tussler's question about uh, responding to some of these more specific allegations, I have to assume, correct me if I'm wrong, that the volume of these inquiries has dramatically increased in the last couple of years compared to previously, and even though I think the 2020 election was in some ways unique, I don't know that that's likely to decrease a lot going forward. So if this is sort of a new uh, role that, that we need you to take on 
Is there diff additional staffing that we could provide or that you would need to really make that a, an ongoing function uh, in, the, in the kind of volume that we're currently talking about? Uh, thank you, Representative Spritzer. I think that's also a great question and, you know, something that the commission will need to consider. And when I say the commission, I mean the six commissioners when they look at our next budget is sort of how have our needs changed and what might we need. Um, if, you know, I had sort of my, my, my dream in terms of what we needed, it would be to have more folks that have data experience and that are able to help with that analysis and providing information. Um, I think data is so critical to elections. And I think the future of elections is allowing people more access to that data and more context around that data. Um, so I, I really do think that that's something we're going to have to talk about with the commission in the next budget cycle, is how has our job changed and how can we get more public information out and how can we do more to help people answer their questions about, uh, about data. That's a, a great segue to one of my other questions, which is it seems like one of the challenges that we're having is that uh, intersection between a database, in this case WISVOTE's uh, database, and Excel or some other sort of uh, spreadsheet type um, system that you get uh, you know, when you uh, do an export out of that database. And so can you help us, you know, we've seen a lot of screenshots of things that look like Excel or some equivalent kind of program. Um, and I'm assuming there are a lot more columns than what is able to show up on any one screenshot. And so can you just help us understand, you know, what are the various kinds of, of column headings and that you would get when you do that request? And are there pieces of data that your clerks have access to in the system that don't necessarily come out on that export? Or is somebody able to look at that and figure out okay, these various records are all, in fact, merged into one, even though they're showing up as different rows, and this person, you know, got an absentee ballot mailed to them but didn't return it and then showed up at the polls at this election, like all of those, you know, things. Is that all in that spreadsheet somewhere, or are there certain things that you'd have to look further to find? Yeah, so you bring up such an important point, and I'll let, I'll let Rob jump in on this too because he works a lot with our data, has a lot of great expertise on that. Um, but what the public can see and what clerks can see are two totally different things. Um, so the statutes actually lay out what is has to be made available in terms of, of, of data lists that people can purchase through the Badger Voters site. So it talks about the columns of data that are available. So when you purchase a voter list, you get things like the voter's name, you get their address, you get their status. We have a subscription service that's required under law where you can see the status of an absentee ballot and who's requested one. But then there's all sorts of other columns of data or places in the database where the clerks can see somebody's date of birth, right? That's personally identifiable information. You cannot buy that information from the voter list. Um, where they can see their driver license number or their social security number. Where they can see the type of proof of residence that they used when they registered to vote. So that's all information that the clerks have available to them. And it's important information when you're making a reliable match, right? So when a clerk gets an alert that says, we've got two records that look like they might be the same person. The name matches, um, the address might match, they might have had a previous address listed. Um, but they're also seeing their driver license matches, their date of birth matches. And that's the type of information a clerk is using to make a um, informed decision about if they merge that record. That is not data that the average person that buys the list is going to be able to have access to, right? Because they can't access personally identifiable information. Um, so in a lot of ways, I, I can understand and sympathize with somebody looking at a voter registration list. They've asked for everything that they can get that's available to them under law. They're not going to see the nuances of how that information has been used merged, maintained um, over history. So is it, is it fair to say that uh, the, I think a lot of the intention of, of setting up and a lot of the use of, of people who do those data requests, I mean, it's people like us who run for office and whether we buy that from you directly or we buy it from our political party who bought it from you and uploaded it to some other database system that's easier for us to use, we're looking for that information that helps us contact voters in our district it wasn't really designed for audit purposes in that sense. And some of the things that folks who are trying to perhaps independently themselves audit an election 
uh, you know, that that's really not what those uh, data requests are, are are leading to. And and in fact, as you said, you know, much of the personal information that could prove to the public that this person is in fact legitimately registered is in fact personal information that we can't just put out on the internet. Is that fair? That's correct. The the law is very specific about, you know, what is considered personally identifiable information and who can have access to that. So clerks can have access to that. Law enforcement can have access to that. The LAB can have access to that. When they got things like voter lists, they get all that information. They looked at things like, are there duplicate people on the list? Have uh, clerks or the WEC been utilizing uh, information we get from Department of Corrections? Have we been doing that correctly? They get access to that type of data, but the, the general public does not um, get access under law uh, to personally identifiable information. Thank you. I just wanted to make the observation, too. If, if folks are curious about what exactly is available in the public data portal, the Badger Voters website, they can actually go to that website. It's badgervoters.wi.gov, and there's a Frequently Asked Questions tab on the site. And if you go to those Frequently Asked Questions, it lists each of the elements of data that are, that are available, either in a voter data request or an absentee ballot uh, record request. And Statute three point or 6.36 talks about the official list and talks about what columns of data have to be maintained and what is and isn't accessible to the public. So I'm, I'm going to ask a, a few questions. The active and the inactive status, um, those are changed by the clerk. And we had had a conversation. I had made a request about trying to have a list of some of those active and actives that have made change by the clerk. But today you also told me that the staff, the WEC staff, has ability to change active from inactive status. Is that correct? That is correct. Uh, most of the staff at the WEC, particularly the staff that work in, in my section that support the statewide system, you know, they have administrative level privileges and, and can perform pretty much any function uh, required in the statewide system. So not only do the clerks have access, and I'm, and that also depends on if you're a provider or not a provider, correct, for the clerks to be able to have that kind of ability to change somebody's active or inactive status? Yeah, some clerks do work in the WISVOT system themselves, and then some small jurisdictions may contract with their county um, to provide those services. So instead of doing voter registration entries themselves, they'll send it to the county. The county does it on their behalf. Um, and the same with merging records and activating records. The county would contractually be doing that on behalf of a municipality. So do we have a list of your staff and the history that have had access to have the ability to change an active or an inactive voter status? Yes, I believe that's actually been provided in one of the earlier requests that was made to DOA, all the all the staff of the agency was. So is this the one that uh, we received from um, Department of Administration? So that includes, I'm assuming, so it's not only staff, but it would be these third-party providers from different companies around the state that do the programming as well on the WEC database, right? Yes, although I'd say there's only one state contract for IT support. Right now, but in the past, well, so. At, at any one time. These different companies, um, Synergy, Velocity, Beachwood, Symphony, plus the contract that we have right now, all of those employees would have had access as well? No, right. those are development staff which right. I think is a little bit different. So development staff has access to what we call our development environment, so their programming. And that is one state contract, right? The state says if you're going to hire IT developers, this is the contract you use. So WEC in no way, shape, or form is unique in that aspect that in state employment, you can't typically hire a state employee at a state employee rate uh, to be an IT developer. So there's a state contract where all agencies hire IT contract developers um, to help with the programming. But they're programming the system. They're not working with voter registration records directly. Correct. And I should also say to Rob's earlier point, even though our so, staff... So oh, I just want to make sure. So we have staff that has access from your department. Mm -hmm. I'm assuming three or Those four... Those are state three, employees. State employees. Correct. And then we have a programming staff um, that, that does the programming but doesn't have access to the records. 
I just want to make sure I'm understanding that. I don't think they would have credentialing necessarily to have access to records. To change records, they don't. They don't right. support uh, clerks. They don't provide any advice. In fact, they 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 uh, they don't really work at the front end of the system at all. They they probably would have some difficulty navigating the clerk side of, of things. But but they do the actual programming for this database, correct? Correct. Yeah, let's say, um, you know, when we had to build in intelligent mail barcodes on absentee ballots. Right. So they're working on programming that um, and testing that to make sure that we that the system works as designed. Okay, so when you say it's a homegrown system that we've built yep. for the state of Wisconsin, it really is dependent on third-party IT vendors, correct, over the years? Contractors that work full-time for our agency and solely for our agency. Yeah, there are individuals that work under my direct supervision that we don't work we don't interface with a company or any corporate management or any there there's no other managers they report to me in the same way that my full-time state employees report to me and I think some of the companies that you just referenced are probably subcontractors right. uh, there's only one one state state contract and that's the only thing that we interface with through the division of enterprise technology okay um, are there other questions at this moment? Or Okay, I'm going to go a little further. 1918, we had lots of conversations about that. Um, that code is supposed to, in the registration, is supposed to mean what? You, you're saying that that was a data transfer from 2005? Uh, 2005, 2006 would have been the initial data transfer. Anyone in the statewide system who has a registration date of 1-1-1918, that means we don't know their registration date. We have never known their registration date, and frankly, we probably never will know their registration date. And the reason for that is actually Wisconsin Act, um, 2003 Act 265. Um, so that's when voter registration was first required in the state of Wisconsin. Um, so prior to 2004, so it was actually April 15th of 2004 that that act was implemented or effective. Prior to that, in many jurisdictions, voters did not have to register in the state of Wisconsin. So when that data came into the statewide database at that time, because every clerk had their own database, they were registering voters or tracking their voters because registration wasn't required in their own spreadsheets, their own databases. And so when that law was passed, and registration was required for everyone, it did not say, people who are already on the clerk's list, you have to re-register, right? The law actually said that registration gets to carry through, put them in the voter registration system, so they don't have a registration uh, date. They, they simply don't because they weren't required under law to register to vote. So the default for those people, and some of them we didn't have a date of birth either because, again, they weren't required to register to vote prior to that law being enacted, so their default date of birth in those instances was 1-1 of 1900, and then the default date of registration was 1-1 of 1918, 18 years later. Um, I, I, I don't know why that decision was made at the time in 2004, uh, but that's the default date they assigned to those individuals so that we could recognize that these are people that were registered in their communities prior to the statewide registration requirement. So those are default dates of registration. And to put a different date in there would not be accurate. They, they did not have to re-register to vote. The clerk can't force them to re-register to vote. So if there were registrations in 2020 from 1918, why would that be? So I, I think that was That's a bit of a misunderstanding because that was looking at inactive records. So remember before when we talked about the active versus inactive, and if somebody registered to vote in 2020, so you went in, you moved, you registered, it's 2020, you're going to have a new voter registration record that shows that you registered to vote on election day in 2020. That's going to be your registration date. But you have that old record still, right? You have your old record from prior to when registration was required that says your registration date was 1-1 of 1918. That inactive record is now going to be merged in with your active record. Because we've got to show your complete history. Yes, you registered to vote, and you have a new registration date of 2020, but you also have an old registration record that's part of your history that has that default date of registration of 1-1 of 1918. So you think going forward that, I mean, part of the clerk's job is to make sure that they have a, a registration on file 
So by allowing the default to go to the 1918 instead of the new date, do you think that creates some issues in the system? I think it creates confusion. And I think for that, you know, I think we all wish that it could get cleaned up. But again, the clerk can't go back and say, you have to re-register. If somebody hasn't moved then since 2003 and they were lawfully in the system prior to the registration well, wait, wait, this is a new registration as of 20. So I'm saying new registrations yep. in 2020 are still showing that date. I don't think that's true. We think those were it, those were inactive records that were merged into a new record that has a new registration date of 2020. Or, or vice versa. Someone the, the clerk could merge it the other way. In other words... So we, don't, so we don't have any consistency on how we're managing the data. We have absolute consistency in how we manage that data. Well, if you, you gave just us said an the example, clerk could go back either way. Because sometimes that is the most recent record. And right. so right. If, if, a, if, a, if we had an example, we would be able to tell you exactly what's happening with that record. Okay. Well, it, it, it makes – okay. Um, so I, I need to ask um, that we were talking about the staff has access to being able to make active or inactive. I have to talk about this API that was found um, not only through Milwaukee but also through the handheld app in the 2020 in the 2020 uh, election. And that API, um, you know, was down. The handheld was downloaded at least a hundred times. And we know that um, in the app itself that it mentions that it has the ability to put you into the system. And we did re reach out and talk about that. So now we're in a series. You mentioned data is so important. We now live in an age where people got to hack into pipelines, that we're in an age where people have the ability. Data security is something, it's, it's a new technology. So I know when I had made a request, you had said that, you know, no, we don't hand, we don't, I don't want to say hand out, that an API is not something that we norm, that we would provide to anybody. How do I have, um, how can we make sure that the system was not able to be accessed and have that capability? I know it's not on one computer, right? But how do we have the confidence that the protection is there after I see two different uses, including this Michael Spitzer Rubenstein referring to the access that they got in Milwaukee through the IT department, that they didn't need to worry about getting access anymore. One of their partners had provided it for them. I can say conclusively that no one outside the state of Wisconsin has access to the statewide system through an API. If there is an API out there, I'd be fascinated to see it. I can tell you there's not. And it's not – if there is, it is well, not we'll to Well, we'll be glad to provide – I mean, we yeah, absolutely. have that. And, and that's a good example of, of you know, the, the kind of information that, that we would love to see. I certainly have heard these allegations, but I personally have not seen the hand any hand. of the technical documentation, any technical documentation And, and the, the conversations that have gone back and forth between – Milwaukee, the IT department, Michael Spitzer, Rubenstein, and their ability to build this real-time system, um, which goes into another question. The clerks of Milwaukee, do they have the ability to hand out the real-time information on Election Day um, as, ap uh, as applications, voter applications, excuse me, ballots have come in? Is that something that they can provide for free? Um, is that something that we say the municipalities have that power to make a real-time determination to hand over that information? So we actually um, had this conversation with our commission. So when you had sent your request, we had this conversation with the commission. And the guidance has been that clerks should be charging the same as the state does for data. Um, now, that being said, they're the custodians of their data. So if they have, they have registration forms, they have absentee ballots, they track these things, and some of them provide information to people that ask and make requests of their offices. Um, but some of those structures in terms of charging for the lists and whatnot do apply both to the locality and to the state. It's not just the charge. It's the ability to get a real-time system, right? Because you said data is so important. So if one group has the ability to get information every night for outstanding ballots, do you consider that a transparent process? Yeah. No one's – I'm sorry. Oh, I would just want to clarify that no one has direct 
digital access to the system. No one in the state of Milwaukee or the city of Milwaukee, sorry, the city of Milwaukee or the, the Mil- city of Milwaukee's IT department has developer I, I, level access. To no, the I, I apologize, and so, you must not be familiar with the emails. Mm-hmm. Claire Woodall no. Vogg made it clear that she would provide to Michael Spitzer Rubenstein every night the updated ward by ward by address ballots that were outstanding in the 2020 election. We we have those conversations, and sure. he at one point says, you don't need to send them anymore, we have access. So you can see why I, I, we're not saying that this did or did not happen. But when you have a conversation between two groups and they say that they have access, you'll have to forgive me for raising my hand and saying, well, that would have been a benefit. So the clerks realized that night after we had that hearing in March, realized they can provide it. They called me. I heard from many clerks around the state, and they had concerns about, yes, you could do that, but if you're going to do that, you should make it available to both parties, right? I mean, we want to have a transparent system. So I'm, I'm, I'm asking you, would that have been not just the cost, but the timing is of value as well, correct? I would say that anyone can buy absentee data, if that's mm. what you're referring to. We actually have to, by law, maintain a subscription so parties, candidates, groups, it's they like a get a three-day delay on that, though. I mean, you're talking. No, that, that's that's a that's self-service right. request, so you can get it instantaneously. You can, yeah, that is real time. It's real time data through Badger voters and parties, campaigns, candidates uh, buy it all the time. So it's it becomes an automated process. So they get it immediately, and and for every election, we have folks from both sides who. So you're saying that request automated that the information that the clerks from Milwaukee and I, I I'm. Just I could have been other communities as well. That her providing that access is something that everybody has access to that every night when they finish. I, you would have to ask those questions of Milwaukee. I have no idea what. No, 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 no. I'm saying though, as they finish the every night, you're saying that that's something that we can purchase regardless of who you are. Every night updates in the real time as ballots are coming in. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I, I would. I would caution against saying access as well. I think yeah. the Milwaukee clerks can hit print. What would be, what and, would be the term can, that you would like me to – well, it's not print. They sent it digitally. What would you like me to call it? Well, I'm quite confident if they sent it digitally, they would have had to use the print function in WISVOTE, which prints it into a PDF, and then okay. you email the PDF. So, I mean, instead of saying access, should I have said um, – Information would that be better, or I would think so. I think that's a oh. more accurate statement to say that you are they, they provide they're providing the information. the information. Okay, I, I can I can take mm-hmm. that. Um, but you're not aware of any API access. You and then as far as charging it for its, uh, charging the information, you're saying the municipalities do have the power not to charge or to charge. You know, that's one of those things where you'd have to talk with the municipality and they'd have to work with their attorneys to figure out what exactly their municipal responsibilities and structure are. When we provide data, we have to rely on administrative code uh, EL 3.5 that discusses the parameters for that. And when we're asked, it's our understanding that that data request process and charging uh, would apply to the jurisdictions as well. I, oh, okay, Representative Roser, I apologize. Do you have one too? Or are you good? Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. I um, just want to clarify the cost thing. Yes. So, if these municipalities requested this information on a regular basis, were they charged twelve thousand five hundred dollars each time they requested that update information? Or would that be a decision that the municipality would make of whether to charge them for that or not? Thank you for that question. And I, I I'm apologize because I feel like I kind of glossed over that. So the state has a statewide system called Badger Voters. And that's where you can go and ask the state for any type of data request that you'd like. So if you want to know how many absentees have been issued in Milwaukee or statewide, you can put in a request and ask us for that data We use administrative code EL 3.5 to determine what has to be charged then for that data. That's what we do. And so the majority of campaigns and candidates, they come through our system to get that data. But some people may ask a municipality directly for some of their data. 
um, and then they would have to rely on their municipal statutory authority and governing process to decide what they can and cannot uh, turn over. I mean, we get questions sometimes, like the questions that came from this committee. I brought it to the commission and I said, are there any exceptions allowed to us under law uh, for providing some of that information? And ultimately they determined, no, there, there isn't any exception. So those are the types of decisions that would have to be made at the municipal level too. Representative Sprite, sir. Uh, I'll yield to Emerson oh, Rasley. Absolutely, Representative Emerson. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I appreciate that because I've got to leave in a minute to go to a different committee. Perfect it's timing. One of those days. So thank you both so much for being here and giving such a thorough presentation. I feel like I've got a much better understanding of, you know, the, the public-facing stuff and, and your records retention that you have. Um, and I guess... Um, it's a little bit of a question, but more of a comment based on what Representative Tussler was saying um, about why aren't you guys kind of proactively getting out there and talking about these things. And I would like to just kind of reframe that in the sense of um, sometimes we will see on Facebook or Twitter or something like that, somebody saying that something was stolen from them. Well, our police departments aren't going out then and investigating that we have to have somebody actually report it to the police department and and I think we need to keep that in mind with this as well that there's people out there making and I will use the word fantastical claims about our elections but they have to bring these things to you guys to investigate them and and I don't think it's fair to say why aren't you getting out there and getting ahead of these things when things haven't been presented to you. And I think that's with the limited resources that you as a state agency have, of course you can't be responding to every Facebook claim, Twitter claim, you know, whatever. So um, I guess my question to you is when things are reported to you, do you in time investigate every one of them? And and can you give me kind of some yeah. time frame basis of that? You know, is it a... I, so that is that is a, a question. Um, so the the statutes give us a process for formal complaints. So formal complaints have a little bit higher, well, much higher bar, where somebody has to submit a sworn statement, provide evidence, and the commission then is going to look at probable cause to make a determination about how to proceed with that. And so those, yes, are absolutely dealt with when we have a sworn complaint with that type of evidence. That's absolutely something that we have to look into and address. We also try our best to listen to other questions and concerns that are brought to us. But usually, if something doesn't have additional information or data that they're providing to us to look into it. Um, like, for example, we'll often hear, I was at my polls, Not I shouldn't say often, but we'll hear somebody on election day will call and say, I was at my polls, and there was a bus of people that didn't look like they were from my town. Well, what do you do with that information, right? We can call the clerk, we can call the polling place, we can try to figure out if something unusual is happening, but they should call law enforcement or they should send us some more information so we can act on it. And I think often we find ourselves in that situation where people make a claim, but they don't provide us anything that we can operate under. Um, they send us a picture of a house, but they don't tell us the address. If we knew the address, we'd be able to look at it, and we could see probably in two minutes exactly what the history was of registration at that address. So um, <laughs> we try, we really try to, to look into concerns and questions and claims. Uh, we did look into all of them probably that have been brought before this committee. Uh, we chose in the interest of time, and maybe that was a mistake, uh, not to bring up every single one today. Uh, but we do have additional information we could certainly share if the committee members are still desiring answers on, on specific claims that were made. I would just, if I may, I would just add that, you know, that there certainly is, uh, you know, informal work that's performed when we try to identify some of these situations. And the example I provided in my testimony where we had a civic group come to us with a deputy from the Final Act County Sheriff's Department, you know, we worked with that group to analyze claims that they presented to us. And that was not done through a formal complaint process. They didn't file a statutory complaint with the agency. Um, however, you know, we ultimately determined that some of their allegations were accurate. And those had already been referred for prosecution. But if they hadn't been referred for prosecution, we would have initiated you know, that process. And then it would have become a more formal process. I would say just real quickly, too, that 
we have seen, and I know you all have too, so this is not meant as, as complaining, just as information, but in 2020, um, we saw three times as many contacts to our office. So in previous presidential election years, in the months around the election, we'd have about 300,000 contacts to our office. In 2020, it was more than a million. Um, and and I, not only would I agree with that, and I know from the LA B report, trying to get through them, may I make a suggestion to you to put them in a category? Yeah. Because when people file these, instead of reading through pages and pages, I too got that process yep. Yep. and was given that task as well. Mm -hmm. If you had put them into categories, of what you frequently see from people, we'd be able to have people who have concerns about X, Y, and Z, and also to put it by their municipality. So now we know what area and what their concerns was, I think would have brought a lot more legitimate, made it an easier process than what you have right now, but mm -hmm. that's neither here nor there. Um, Just a, a follow-up sure. question or, or clarifying. When, when you're talking about a sworn complaint, is that something that has to come from the clerks or could anybody in the state or, or around um, actually, yes. I hope I'm not opening up a can of worms for you guys no, here, yeah. but is that something that anybody could do a sworn complaint, right? Yeah, there are two separate types. There's um, the 506 complaint. So if you look at the statute 506, you'll see that complaint process. And that's alleging some type of a violation by an election official. So saying somebody didn't properly notice this um, canvas or whatever it might be, you're saying that an election official did not do, do their job appropriately. And in that instance, um, you have to be a resident of that jurisdiction to have standing. Um, so either live in that municipality, if it's a municipal claim, um, or if it's against the state, I guess it could be any resident of the state. Um, and then there's a 505 process uh, and those are confidential, and those are dealt with, um, th those deals with violations of election laws. So it could be by a member of the public um, or by an election official, but that's where you're looking at things more like voter fraud um, and, and, and things like that. I just want to give Representative Murphy, he's running two. Or, or okay, I just, a super quick clarifying with that. And so those, um, those confidential pieces, like they have to give specific information as far as person and and it can't just be like a general thing it needs to be like i think somebody took my mom's registration and voted because i know that she was actually out of the country that day or something like that it has to be very specific to get that sworn complaint correct yeah and for the 506 um you know there, there's a good process on our website and we've done a lot of work because i think it, it frankly it was confusing and people were confused about the process and so the commission and the staff did work uh, before 2020 to try to make that process more understandable um, but if you go onto the election commission's website and you go to complaints so there's an, oh, we're actually getting an overhaul of our website but right now if you go on the left hand side and go to complaints It'll walk you through what's required for a 506 complaint or a 505 complaint to be brought before the commission. But yes, it, it does require a sworn statement, which is what differentiates it from just somebody calling us and, and sort of making a claim or asking a question. Thank you for helping me understand that, and I appreciate you, um, Representative Murphy, giving me a <laughs> Thank you. You're so welcome. Representative Murphy. Thank you, Madam Chairman, and uh, I'd like to thank both of you for coming here and testifying. Um, my comment uh, on the information that was brought to us in our last hearing, uh, you know, I, I think there's an issue when uh, allegations are brought, and it, it seemed as if uh, the allegations, it was, it was more about volume than it was about accuracy. And so lots of volume of information improprieties were brought and uh, to tell you the truth even on the day that they were presented I knew that some of them were incorrect um, I think uh, myself and I think some of the other members of the committee uh, already knew that uh, Ambrose Adventure was <laughs> was a, a legitimate voter that that had come out uh, and and I think the the issues with um, the voter residences and the multiple multiple votes coming from residences. Uh, I suspected that these were going to you know there are apartment building situations and 
campus uh, dorm situations and that kind of thing were going to come up. And so um, not that surprised by that. Um, the one thing that, though, that you didn't speak to, and I think the thing that was uh, the most bothersome to me was the uh, individual voter records uh, that were brought up. Um, you know, I, I happen to have two of them in front of me here. One is for uh, an Andrew Miller, uh, all at the same address, uh, voting uh, about a half a dozen times, um, all on 2021. Shows him voting at the poll, at the poll, at the poll, at the poll. Uh, and then also a, a registration for a uh, Kristen Marie Zurich who is uh, registered and active uh, also like five times. And so I'm trying to understand where those might come from and um, why maybe you didn't mention them earlier. Uh, thank you for that. And I can start, but then hand it over to Rob. So those are really good examples, and we'd be glad to even send you a write-up if you'd like about those specific ones, if that would be useful. Um, but I think those are instances of, of errors. They, they are true instances of errors, either when the data was being entered into the statewide system or transferred into the statewide system from an e-poll book where there was an, a, a duplicate that was created at that time. It was an error. And like Rob said, we don't hide our errors. That's part of the reason we have to keep that inactive history of a voter record is if there was a mistake made, we need to have a record of that. We need to go back and say, okay, yes, we can see there was a mistake that was made here. Um, what wasn't shown as part of that presentation and that data mm -hmm. is that those voters only have one active record, right? And so what you're seeing is that when the state list was purchased with all of the inactive and active records, we're now looking at it in a vacuum and we're saying, okay, how many records did this individual have um, and those are all showing up, right? They're showing the mistakes and they're showing the legitimate ones. What it doesn't show is that in a matter of seconds that those were all merged into one record. So this all came up from a single? That's right. A single Yes. Record. Okay. Yes. Now, uh, that's all well and good. Um, I get that. It just seems very odd to me that from that single record, um, so you have a 10-digit registration number, uh, one ending in 62, 164, 165, one ending in 66, one ending in 67, one ending in 70, and then, you know, all the same date and all showing as voting at the poll. I don't, I don't, how do you make that mistake? I, I'm, did you enter the, does somebody enter the data wrong six times in a row or? <laughs> I don't think it's showing as voting at the polls. It's showing as registering at the polls. Oh, that's e registering. E each yeah. record, though, I believe in the case of Mr. Miller there, would show participation. The thing to be clear about is that you know, Mr. Miller didn't walk through the polling place 10 times or however many times the, the, the record is there, uh, nor mm -hmm. did anyone manually key in that data. That data was uploaded from the jurisdiction to our system. And the reason you see repeat entries like that is the system – uh, had a glitch during the upload process and repeatedly created a record for this voter. And those records were then... Is the system reassigning him a number? It's giving him a new number. They're creating new records each okay. time. You know, all of those records were identified... So those are, that's not an inputted registration ID number? It, it is not. So to, to build that record... What does need to be inputted? So, I mean, if the registration number isn't the key to developing this, what is? So the law actually specifies what has to be part of a voter registration. So what's part of a voter registration is your name, your date of birth, your address. You have to provide proof of residence, or if you register to vote online, you've got to make a match with the DMV. Okay. Um, and then you're going to have your driver license number. So those are all the components of the... Um, the registration, and also would allow us to identify immediately that we created duplicates. When this data was uploaded, we created duplicates, and we know that with 100% certainty because every single field in that voter's record matches. 
Okay. Voter registration number is really just a categorizing thing. It's never used to identify duplicates because it's really not a useful number for that purpose. That's why we use personally identifiable information that's unique to the voter. Okay. So if I could. Go ahead. I, I would just like to clarify that, you know, I made reference during my testimony to, to typos and errors, and we certainly see quite a lot of that with manually keyed registration data. The case of Mr. Miller is not one of those examples. It's not an example of manual data entry. <clears throat> that was from one of the few jurisdictions in the state that uploaded their election day registration data electronically, and the system at our end had an error and misread that data. That is the responsibility you know, of the WISVOTE team. That's my team. That happened on my watch. That's our mistake. Okay. So is this an issue with the with the hardware or software? <laughs> I, you know. That was a software issue that's that's since been corrected. Um, if I were to, to provide an example, I'd, I'd provide the example of making a payment online, and they always warn you don't click don't <laughs> click order more than once because if you do, you might bring okay. up a bunch of credit card transactions, and that that's effectively what happened here. All right, I will uh, I yield. Fair Thank enough. You. Fair enough. So. Um, I, I, I think that that last conversation has created more questions. I think of the data. Have you have you ever had the database audited at a computer? Um, have the ability to have a, a forensic audit to clean up some of the things, provide more clarity. H have you had that done? Yes. So I would I would point you back to the Legislative Audit Bureau's report where they did go through and identify, do we have duplicate people on the list? Are we removing people that are deceased or maybe are now felons? They did that analysis. We don't remove system. people. Let's be very clear. We never deactivate. remove anybody. Yes. Mm -hmm. We deactivate. And there were actually quite a few issues that they found within the LAB report that they had repeated back to you about double voters and some of the concerns that they had within. There were 70 people that, 70 people or so uh, that, I mean, it was a small amount. Yes. It's not like they yes. audited the full 7 million people. They took a very small audit of that. They had the full list available to them, the entire list. They did, the but that is not them. what they audited. They audited a small piece of it. Um, I don't believe that's true when it comes to looking yeah. at the actual data. They and audited 14,000 some odd records, right? Those That, I, I believe, and I don't have it in front of me, unfortunately, yeah. but I believe that is uh, looking at the actual ballots. They went out and looked at actual ballots. Oh, sure. yeah. But they did look at the full database, and they did make a recommendation about also looking at another piece of data as we identified duplicates, because like you said, there were 70 potential matches they identified, and they suggested to us, and we have since implemented, that we also look, when we're looking for duplicates, that we also look for driver license number. Well, yes, that is certainly depending on how you register, if you register online or if you register at the polls, they're completely different processes, correct? And that has created some issues as well. And Not online voter registration is far different. It's 100 percent verification versus that is not done till after the clerks have entered the information, which could be up to 45 or 60 days, roughly. Right. After an election? I, I see what you're saying. Yes, online voter registration, when somebody registers to vote, they have to match what's on their driver license with what they're entering in their voter registration record. If it doesn't match, they can't register to vote online. With an in-person registration, be it at the clerk's office or by mail uh, before Completely election Completely different processes. Yes, there's a difference. Unfortunately, process. I wish they were one. Um, are, 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 have you had any investigation from the FEC from you, your staff, clerk, any clerks, are you aware of any of any investigations that are going on onto the either Badger books, WIS votes, anything? Is anything currently going on? In terms of looking into duplicate records? Or, or just having an investigation on any of these issues? We work with the Department of Homeland Security regularly to look at our system as well and to analyze it as well. Um, those are, of course, classified, but um, those are the types of things that we do on a regular basis. But you have nothing current with the FEC going forward at this point? We have nothing current with the FEC. Okay. No, I'm not aware of that being an election practice. So um, you mentioned about working Homeland Security. Um, I think one of the questions in one of the lawsuits that went forward in Waukesha has to do with um, guardianship and people who have been um, 
we call them uh, uh, folks who have guardianships, right? And making sure that they are not on the voter list. And we've had some issues with that in Wisconsin. Is that something that we're looking forward to correct so that the clerks are aware that people who have been, um, they have guardianships for all reasons, a bunch of reasons that they're not included on the voter list? Is that something that we're going to resolve or is that something that you realize, I mean, by HAVA rules, we should make sure that these people are not included on the voter list and it looks like we've been having problems for the clerks to be able, I mean, the clerks can only work with what they have. Right. Is that something that you plan to address? So that's, that's a great question. So the court system provides us with information on voters who have been adjudicated incompetent to vote. Thank you, that's the word adjudicated. Um, yes. So the law says that unless you've been adjudicated by a court as incompetent to vote, you still have the right to vote. And so we get that information, but it's a lot less frequent than DOC or DHS or other uh, entities provide us that information. The court system doesn't work as quickly. So we do get that information from the court system and we provide it to clerks, but it is not as quick as it should be or as we'd like it to be um, for the clerks to be able to take as, as quick action on that as they do other information. And we are indeed working with the court system to see if there's something we can do to get that information from them more quickly and to make sure that it, that information is available to the clerks so they can take action on inactivating those records um, as soon as they So can. that seemed to be the problem. The records were inactivated and they got reactivated. And that's another reason that I had asked for history on some of this. Um, but I was told that it would cost $100,000 and you have to shut down the system for five weeks, which I don't know exactly that, that brings confidence to the process. But I think we need to talk about another thing since Homeland Security is we have not been providing the clerks with um, aliens in the state of Wisconsin who are, if you have an H-1 visa or any of those other issues, we've been not providing that information on driver's license so they do not have the ability to vote. Now, you're right, by registration they should know that, but um, we seem to have a couple problems with that as well going forward. Is that something that you plan to fix going into the next election to make sure that clerks are aware of that list of legal aliens in the state of Wisconsin that do not have the right to vote? Thank you for that question. That would require a statutory change, and there actually have been a number of bills, including one, I think, that's being I don't know right how now. that's a statutory change. Under HAVA, it clearly says that we are to provide lists to make sure that they're clear. I mean, under the HAVA... Um, rules. It's. It's. I mean, I don't know that that requires a statutory change. That is part of the rules to make sure that we are clearly identifying for clerks so they know who does and does not have the right to vote. Clerks get the required information under HAVA and under statute for information from the, the driver license entity. That, I think, is what you're referring to. Mm -hmm. But if, if the state desired for clerks to get additional information about citizenship data... Um, I believe that's called the SAVE database. Um, in 2010, we did a very detailed analysis about what would be required to be a member of that and to do that additional step. And I do believe there is a new bill floating around right now um, that asks those same questions. So I guess I, I, I stand behind that we are doing what's required by HAVA and what's required under state law in terms of providing driver license eligibility information to clerks. But if the state desires for the clerks to have additional information, it would require a statutory change. Well, I mean, state law requires citizenship to vote, right? That's correct. It's a self-affirmation on the registration. So I, I guess I'm, I'm concerned that that does not require a statutory change. But I guess that's not a conversation for right now. Um, but I am concerned about it as it is almost hard for clerks to make that identification off a driver's license between somebody who is an alien with a driver's license in the state of Wisconsin, a, a non-citizen legally here in the state of Wisconsin, uh, for clerks to be able to make that differential. Um, I, I appreciate your patience. Um, Representative Roser. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I, I apologize profusely for not being here for your whole presentation. I, we're, we're juggling lots of committees, but I look forward to reading through your testimonies and uh, appreciate so much your willingness to come. Uh, 
I, I think that one thing that we can all agree on is that we want fair, honest, transparent vote, a, a, all of that in a voting Ready. process. Um, we want a process of integrity. I live in central Wisconsin. I believe my clerks do a yeoman's job in maintaining their poll lists, in knowing the people, and and they deserve a lot of commendation for their, their work and, and their process of integrity. I believe strongly that every eligible voter in the state of Wisconsin needs to be given the opportunity to vote without disenfranchising them or anything. But the system's got to be hard to cheat. <laughs> and that is, I think, where our politicization of this process has taken place over the months. I, um, I appreciate you acknowledging that errors occur. There were recommendations from the LAB audit, and I would like to, and you may have addressed this, and if you have, I apologize again. But um, I hope that you are taking those recommendations mm -hmm very, very seriously, because I think you also have a desire to have a fair, honest, and transparent process that is void of fraud, the possibility of fraud. Uh, I think that because of what's been happening over these months, that you have to take even the perception that you are not doing those things very seriously. And so uh, my desire as a state legislator representing my district that wants it to be hard to cheat but easy for eligible voters to vote, um, I, I think you share that. And I hope that you are doing what's necessary to be above um, the perception that you are not being those things. So can you just comment on that a few minutes for the sake of my understanding and for the sake of the people that are watching this hearing today. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. I, that's an excellent question. And I can assure you that I and everyone that works at our agency and our commission, our bipartisan commission, um, shares that desire to have accurate elections with integrity. I, I like to always tell people that sometimes if you'd listen to the political rhetoric, you'd, you'd have to, you'd be led to believe that you can either have elections that are accessible or elections that are secure. You can have both. We can have both. We, sh we do have both. And I think that having conversations like this is another step towards uh, figuring out how we can make sure that we have both. We have elections that are accessible and we have elections that are secure. And I really believe that we do. I really believe that we do. But I think we can do more to show people how it works. It's a complicated system. Um, I will never fault somebody for asking questions about the system, genuine questions about the system, because it is complex. And I think that it is my job, and I have a sincere passion for sharing how elections work, sharing the mechanics, opening up the hood and showing people this is how it works. You can decide for yourself if you think this is a good way for it to work, but this is how it works, um, because that's the other part of it. There's no good laws or bad laws from my perspective. Um, when I started in elections in 2011, my first job was to implement the photo ID law. So I went out around the state and I talked to clerks, I talked to lawmakers, I talked to voter groups about the photo ID law. It was very polarizing. And I would start every single presentation by saying, I'm not here to talk about if this is a good law or a bad law. I'm not here to talk about the merits of it. I'm here to make sure you have the information you need uh, to be able to navigate this process. And I think we're in a similar place today. We need to get more good information out to people so that they know how to make informed conclusions about our election process. And so I, I really do think we sh share that desire. Um, I think sometimes we fall short in getting that information out just because it can feel overwhelming. It can feel like every day we've climbed a mountain and there's a new one in our, our way that we have to climb that next day. Uh, but that doesn't mean we give up um, on trying to continue to make our process even more secure, even more accessible, and to show people how our system works so that they can have that same confidence. And in terms of the LAB report, I can also assure you we are taking that very seriously. The commission had a 13-hour meeting, I believe, on December 1st, where we went through every single recommendation and again, the six-member, evenly split, bipartisan commission, they took some type of direction on every single one of those recommendations. 
And so at the March meeting of the commission, the commission will also report out the status on every single effort that they've taken to address that report. If I may, Madam Chair, just uh, ask a follow-up question. Sure. So I, you, you make an excellent point about the complexity of the process. I'm a KISS person. Keep it simple, sister. But I'm not going to use the word <laughs> stupid. So um, when, when you have such complexity, you can see how it just feeds into misinformation and confusion. And um, I have sat down for many minutes with my local clerk in my county to try to understand. I work as a poll worker. I've attended those election schools and things like because I want to try to understand some of that. And the, the clerks express some um, concern that we make their job harder by adding requirements and you know some of, a lot of the poll workers are elderly and so every time they come to work at the polls the rules change and they have to adapt to that which sometimes is is very difficult to do so so I, the complexity bothers me it i mean we've got technology we ought to be able to do this simply i don't you know you said about how not very timely do you get the court system information why not? You can click a button and get that. And so in my simple mind of how technology works, um, there ought to be some way to break through the complexity so that it doesn't make it as confusing and that it makes it understandable. And um, I, I wish we could do that better, but we don't do that very well. Do we make it complex just so it is hard to understand and, and, and people you know that work by the KISS principle get confused and it's overwhelming and I don't know it breaks my heart what has happened since the November 2020 election it's been divisive it's for those of us that represent communities to be attacked every time we go to a meeting that uh, we're not doing enough to make sure that it, it's it's been a very politicized thing and and I feel really bad about that and so Thank you for giving me a platform to just vent for a few minutes, but I, I challenge you to do what you can, and we try to be as reasonable and commonsensical from our perspective, but I just appreciate your willingness to come today and be interrogated and to answer questions about what happens. I hope it wasn't considered interrogation. Well, <laughs> you know, and, and maybe that's the wrong word, and that may be adding to the confusion and the <laughs> politicization, but... Uh, the willingness to answer questions, and I, I really appreciate that, and and thank you for what you do to try to make things understandable when um, it's been difficult. Thank you. Thank you, Representative, and, and thank you for allowing us to be here, truly. I mean, thank you for um, accommodating us today. We really appreciate it. And you brought up a good point that I don't know what to sort of, you know, how to, to build on this. But our clerks have so much knowledge, you know, and, and is there something that we can do to empower them to be able to show their communities how they run elections? They're given almost nothing in a lot of our small communities to be able to do their job, yet alone to put out public information. And so that might be a great place or a great you know, line of thought to run with is how do we empower our clerks to be able to get more information to the public about how elections work? Because people trust their clerk, as they should. Their clerks do a phenomenal job. And so how do we make sure that they're creating opportunities for sort of meaningful engagement in elections? Fair enough. Our clerks do really work hard, and we certainly want to remember that after yesterday. Representative Spritzer. Thank you for entertaining a couple last uh, questions. Uh, I've got a specific one and then a general one. Uh, so specifically, while we were in the hearing, I actually got an email from Peter Berniger about that uh, 4019 Outer Loop Road, uh, town of Summers issue. So I just wanted to give you a chance to, to address that. Um, in, in his own words, uh, he says, helping to clarify 357 re registrants at 4019 Outer Loop Road, Kenosha, parentheses, town of Summer. List is attached. The address hasn't existed for 10 years. The road, in fact, was destroyed, replaced with the new one, new address. Point was, these should not be on WISVOTE to have accurate, clean, efficient voter lists required by statutes. I said that in the hearing last week. Source of the data, WEC. And then he did, in fact, attach a spreadsheet, uh, which, just to summarize, shows that every single one of these is listed as inactive. Uh, and by my scanning through, they appear to have initial voter registration dates 
uh, between the 90s and 2008. I didn't find any after 2008. So now in my words, am, am I correct in, uh, that your response to this is essentially that this is the system working as intended because these are in fact inactive because nobody newly registered at this address after it ceased to exist, but that even 10 years from now, there are still going to be these records in there because this is never going away. These are going to be maintained as historical records. And so, you know, the idea that we can have a philosophical disagreement about whether we want a clean list or we want historical data, but uh, you are going to always keep the historical data. And that is a separate concept from the actual list of active registered voters that uh, creates the poll book at any given election. Have I s sort of summarized that fairly, and do you have anything to add? That's correct, and I would add that's a fair point, that it's a little funny to see a, a street name that is no longer in use. Uh, that Outer Loop Road street name is blocked in Wisfold. It's retired in Wisfold. No new voters can register at Outer Loop Road. Instead, the new name, University Drive, uh, comes up. Um, however, you're correct that you know anyone who was registered years ago at the Outer Loop Road address, they're going to re retain that registration information in the system. And, you know, that happens all the time. There's what we call annexations and consolidations. Sometimes municipalities cease to exist anymore, right? And so we can't go back in an old historic record that's no longer active and change the information where they registered to vote. Because, again, those are just historical records that have to be maintained as they were entered into the system for the sake of history. Um, I also want to, if I, I can brag for just a moment, we have one of the most comprehensive addressing systems um, in elections probably in, in the country. We were one of the first states to take on a fully geo-enabled election, which means that we're not just putting in addresses. There's actual geolocation that happens using mapping software to determine exactly where somebody's address is when a clerk is entering those voter registrations. Um, and we're so grateful that we have that system in place now with redistricting and whatnot. It'll help make things even more accurate. Um, but addressing is an actual science, and we have a really good system. Um, our clerks, they're doing complicated GIS work in our system in assigning every single voter the correct address, a rooftop pin to make sure that they've got the correct address, that we validate that address, that we get it um, consistent in terms of the formatting of that address. Um, and I don't even think the clerks know, because our system's pretty easy to use in that respect, how much complicated addressing work they're doing every time they enter a voter registration record. Thanks. And then my general question is, uh, Rob, you said at the beginning that we're always looking for ways to improve the system, and there are certainly opportunities for improvement. So understanding that some of the things like retaining historical data is not something you're necessarily looking to change because that's not a, a bug, it's a feature. Um, are there things that you would like to see improved or that if we wanted to see improved, you could sort of get us you know, a, a sense of what that would take so that we could explore whether the legislature wanted to provide the, the funding you know, and, and potentially the staff to make those improvements? How can we sort of continue that dialogue going forward? Certainly, and thank you for that. I, I think there are several places you know, where, that we can work on, and one of the things that came up earlier in discussion was just the demand that's on the agency to field questions and investigate claims, and that's all incredibly labor-intensive work, and of course we have a very small staff to handle, handle everything. Um, and you know, un until uh, relatively recently, we've just had one part-time public information officer to, to handle it. So you know that's that's the kind of challenge where it, it would take some action, mm. uh, some additional resources, you know, to help us manage that that workload. Um, another item that came up in discussion was uh, the subject of uh, adjudicated, adjudicated incompetent voters. You know, I think if uh, our geo-enabled systems are at the forefront of technology in in the nation, uh, I think the, the way in which we process adjudicated incompetent voters is probably at the other end of the spectrum. It's certainly one of our, I think, one of the things we can improve. And to Representative Rosar's, you know, point, that that's an area where technology should be able to make things faster and more efficient for us. And, we, you know, we have recently had conversations with the, the state court system about automating that process and creating a digital process to obtain those, those records more rapidly than we currently do. 
Well, and I think the other part of that is the adjudicated voter was then turned back to active. And so that in itself creates an issue where we have voters that should already have gone through the process and now have been made active again for a serious election. So um, that's a problem. And that goes back to that active, inactive process that, you know, Representative Murphy had talked about as far as who has access, who has the ability to make those changes. Now we know it's staff and clerks and, um, and, and some of those concerns, uh, which I think are going to go forward because it's a real time shot. I think what would be really useful is if you, as da- daily, as these changes are made, as to have let both sides, let everybody have access to it, would be a really great process. So that way people could see this active and inactive process as it happens so we can build voter confidence in it um, to put it on the database and allow us, if, if you want to charge $20 for every day, but to make it either parties, independents, anybody to have that access every day would provide more um, transparency to a process because this process, as it was built, as you said, before your time does not allow us to determine how many ballots have gone out and come back without going through every county. It it doesn't necessarily have any um, checks and balances from that process. Um, It's very expensive. And now you've told me that voter numbers really don't matter. Am I I to understand that you really consider them of no value? Because you you can reach it. I mean, it, am I saying that wrong? I would say voter registrations and numbers are not a requirement to vote in the United States. No, I'm, I'm not saying they were. But I'm saying as far as managing the data, if you can have a clerk go back to the old one or create a new one or they merge and you have multiple that merge into one depending on the day, you can see how there would be a lot of questions if you were to grab snapshots of those days, Correct. Oh, and I think that's certainly one of the sources of, of misinformation and confusion that, that we've seen out there because folks are looking at snapshots of the database from one, and we two, don't, five years ago. Right, and we also don't have information monthly to compare it to. There's no historical left information. Like, there's nothing from each end of the month, you know, having some sort of snapshot so you can see some of those information as we yeah, – that's yep. That is not correct. Um, okay. uh, you know, as I think I mentioned during my testimony, and I might have gone over it pretty quickly, but there's actually about 20 copies of the entire statewide database that are produced every single year. That's how many we're selling every single year for the last 10 years. So, okay, is 20, so let me 20 sure. data sets. Okay, what data sets are we talking about? That then? the entire uh, that is the entire statewide voter registration database. And is it on a certain date? I'm saying they're based on the dates that they were requested by customers, be they Republican, Democrat, you name it. And we do have other statistics that we we actually are required to post and do on voter registration numbers and the trends on that. So that's sort of free data that's on our website is some of those historical um, trends, bigger picture. Oh, sure. How many percentage of folks voted and how and the, how I mean, when I say how online or yeah, right, gotcha. how many registered to vote, um, requested absentees. We did some really detailed analysis of that data, too, after the November election. So we have a full data report from the post uh, 2020 election uh, that we presented to our commission. And, you know, another thing I, I'll just say is I'm not holding water for the fact that, you know, our lists are expensive. I, 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 we didn't make that determination. That's something that's determined uh, by law. It was actually s- established in 2008 um, was when that was established. And so the commission actually recently asked us to look at if there is anything else we might be able to do in terms of offering some low-cost reports to the oh, public. I, I, think it's, um, I think it's very much true. Yeah, or if uh, we want to relook at that administrative rule and see if there's any changes that they want to make. I can't make them. The commission can make them or the legislature can change the law, um, but that's something that we're, we are looking at. And I think personally, for what it's worth, it would be great if we could provide more data to people uh, free of cost because you're right. 
people want that transparency data. people understand the process yep. what yep. we see it's i think it's it's becoming a, a lot we're beginning to get through some of these questions will you be give me two more i'll try the 999 zip codes what was up with that the 999 zip codes were in the system uh, they're always going to be in our historical records because they were in the system. Uh, only postal service, accurate postal service zip codes can be used in the system today. I don't know uh, off the top of my head. I don't recall when the 999s were created. Uh, those are effectively their garbage, their garbage records. Uh, they're inactive records. They're not active records. You will not find an active voter record in the state of Wisconsin with a 9999 zip code. Okay. And so when we say that we made this database, we homegrown, grew it, had that conversation, um, somebody had to be the, the plan architect on this. Mm -hmm. And that was not a state employee. That was... It was a state employee, absolutely. Otherwise... Um, I spent a whole lot of time testing and architecting that. So, so you did. are the you are you are the architect of it. Oh no, not me myself, but the state employees. We did indeed. Uh, we did indeed work with the developers to plan out to test the entire system. It is not a product that's available for sale anywhere else. It's a custom coded system that's built on a CRM platform. Um, and I can say with a hundred percent confidence, because I was part of the team that we architected and built. The, the system that we And used. that was what year? Um, it was implemented in 2016. So 2016. in 16, you had a huge hand, and then we... I wasn't, uh, no, I wasn't the decision maker. I wasn't the one making the decisions, but I was on staff at the time. Who was the one that made the, the decisions on it then? So it would have been the IT manager and the administrator and the commission um, at the time. Um, and the project was actually started under the GAB. So the GAB is the one that authorized the, the start in the project, there is extensive documentation um, that outlines that process for how that system was built, developed, you know, what was involved, the various components um, is very well documented. And I know there were issues back, you know, building. Okay. Um, all right. Um, and then the voter registration numbers, last question for you. If I was to, so you, why are they out of sequence? Why don't why aren't they sequential? I mean, all, all new voter registration numbers are are sequential. So a, again, any any of the unusual numbers that you see are, are going to be from records that have been in our system for a very long time. We so, we know we no longer have you know generate those weird voter registration numbers. Our That's, system never yeah. generated. We yeah. we always did sequential numbering, but again, the old records that came in from those legacy systems before two thousand four will have the numbering convention used by that clerk. I, I, I mean, I, 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 on one of these, they pulled the last 100 numbers, and they're about as unsequential as you can probably be. So if I, if I give this to you, you'll be able to tell me that from the state that, I mean, there's no sequence to these at all, from the last voter numbers from 11-2 to 11-1. You'd be glad to certainly, take a look yeah, at what you're looking at. Uh, oh, okay, okay, because they're certainly not sequential yeah. by any means. Or do they come with nine digits or eight digits? Or So I'll, I'll make sure to forward that we can have that conversation. Certainly. I appreciate it. With that, any – oh, Representative Roser. No. <laughs> We, we're, we're, we, we're not too bad today. Two well, hours. yeah, and I thank you, Madam Chairman, for giving me another opportunity. I, I'd like to totally change uh, issues. Uh, indefinitely confined individuals, mm -hmm. uh, and I hope you haven't talked about this and I missed it, but um, I truly believe that that category was abused in the November 2020 election. We have um, some anecdotal stories about people voting indefinitely confined and going on the campaign trail and you know I mean there and just by looking at the sheer numbers there were issues with indefinitely confined can you just give me um, an overview of and I know the COVID situation made it very very difficult and some of the guidelines that came out were um you came from WIC, and so uh, the clerks got some information. 
Can you t- give me some information on how you see that category going forward? How are we going to tighten that up so that um, we kind of kept today really about the voter rolls? Oh, okay. And so, I well, mean, you but are there are people have on the voter was, rolls uh, that are yeah. indefinitely confined and never showed okay. voter IDs oh, okay. well, I mean, and things like that. So, uh, Megan, it's your decision. Yeah, can you yeah. give me the process for how you? process indefinitely can find voters and put them on the voter rolls. Sure. And thank you, Madam Chair, if it's okay if I talk to her a little bit about it. So I'd be glad to talk to you more about this offline, too. Um, But there actually was a court decision in 2020 from the Wisconsin Supreme Court, I have it right here, that um, affirmed the commission's guidance on indefinitely confined. And indefinitely confined is established by Wisconsin state law And what it says is that if somebody is unable um, to get to the polls because of age, illness, infirmity, or disability, the statute does not offer any additional clarity to those categories, that a person can request uh, an absentee ballot. And probably the most important part about that is then they're exempt from the photo ID requirement. So they don't have to provide a photo ID as part of that. Um, The commission's guidance also said that this cannot be used as a workaround of the photo ID law. So it really has to be somebody that falls into one of those categories because of age, illness, infirmity, or disability. Um, And so the Supreme Court did say that they agreed with the commission's interpretation um, of that guidance. Now, that being said, um, there is a cleanup process, shall I say, for, for indefinitely confined lists as well. So first of all, the clerks can sort of take on a voluntary process where after after an election, they contact people and say, hey, um, this is what indefinitely confined means. Um, Just want to make sure that this still applies to you. And many of our clerks did that after the 2020 elections or during the 2020 elections to check in with their voters to make sure that they meant to make that distinction. Uh, But then after a general election, there is also a process where if somebody has not returned their ballot as an indefinitely confined voter, they are taken off the indefinitely confined voter list. Um, So that's something where, um, you know, every election clerks are doing that sort of maintenance on the indefinitely confined list to ensure that people that are on that list, that it still lawfully applies to them. Um, But beyond that, I don't really have much more to say. I think that if um, if there was a desire to see that requirement more tailored or changes to it, it would require a statutory change. With that, any further questions? I thank you so much for your time today. All members, thank you so much. This ends the hearing. This program is a production of Wisconsin Eye, an independent, nonpartisan, nonprofit media network with a mission to inform, educate, and engage the citizens of Wisconsin. Wisconsin Eye is the nation's first and only independently funded state civic broadcast network, providing gavel-to-gavel access to government proceedings and events at the state capitol. 